Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. I have been so blessed these last two weeks listening to two of my favorite pastors preach, Pastor Josh and Pastor Chris. They did amazing, amazing jobs. I was blown away last week by Pastor Chris. Um, I, I told him, like seriously, I said, man, I, I didn't have the bar set that high for you, and you just blew me away. Not that I was doubting him, but I was like, bro, like you brought the word last week. Like you crushed it. I was so impressed by it. He kicked off a series called Timelines. Timelines, it's a brand new series that we're in. And here's kind of the big idea behind it. Waiting on God to act and trusting in his promises can be challenging. Sometimes we feel like we need to help God out and take matters into our own hands. But the Bible shows that that doesn't always work out well for us. So what do we do when God doesn't move on our timeline? What do we do when God isn't moving when we think he should move? God, you should have answered me already. You should have done this already. Anyway, I'm trying, I got all these ideas going through my mind, but I, I can't jump ahead. Our key text for this series is Habakkuk 2.3. Habakkuk says this, for the revelation awaits an appointed Time. Pastor Chris told us that that time there is the word kairos time. It means a window of opportunity. I'm going to tell you this about life. You must seize the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of the opportunity. Have you ever gone to the store and you saw a, a uh, item of clothing on sale? And you're like, oh, I would love to have it. I'll come back for it. And then you come back for it and it's gone. Because there was a Kairos moment. There was a window of opportunity, right? Oh, man, I'd love to buy that house. There was a good price on that house. And then you're like, all right, call the real estate agent. And then the house is gone or the market shifts and the price goes up, right? There's Kairos moments of time. This is what it's talking about here. There's an appointed time, and it speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger. Wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Here's one thing that aggravates me about God. Can we be honest? God aggravates me sometimes. Does he not aggravate you sometimes? He, he does. He aggravates me sometimes. And, and it's okay. We have a relationship. We can talk like this. Because he tells me, son, you piss me off. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm sure God does not talk that way, but my mind translates it that way, Okay. My dad had a statement that he would say. My dad founded this church in 1982, and this was like a key verse, that, uh, not a verse, but a key saying that he would also say, God ain't never early, but he ain't never late. That ain't good grammar, but you get the point. And we know it's true. And that bothers me about God sometimes. Nobody else. No? Because like, for me to be on time, I'm early. I'm early to almost everything. So here at staff, I've got this little saying, and I know, I know where we are at in society today, but it bothers me when someone's work day starts at 9 a.m. and they walk in the door at 9 a.m. Like that bothers me, right? And then I know there's all those memes and videos and snaps and all that stuff. Well, if you want me here at 8.45, start paying me at 8.45. But listen, let me just talk about this for a second, okay? Let me just talk about this for a second. I don't pay you to get a cup of coffee. I don't pay you to take your coat off. And I don't pay you to go to the bathroom. Right? So if you want to do all that stuff before you get to work and the moment you walk in, your coat is already off and you're logged into your computer, then we got a deal. Right? But like, I think that that's God. Like God does that to us. He shows up right on time. And I'm like, brother... Could you like ease into the blessing? Could you give me an 845 blessing and not a 9 a.m. blessing? 
right? This is what I know about God. God don't do nothing fast. But when he does it, he does it fast. <laughs> Praying ain't nothing happened. Praying ain't nothing happened. Praying ain't nothing happened. The Bible said, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven. <laughs> Dear Lord, I would have preferred a gradual blessing over time so I knew he was working on it. He bothers me about that sometimes. And that's okay. He's a big God. He understands. But as we're going to get into it, we're going to look at why God operates that way and why it aggravates us so much. Let's start. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us in our ignorance and you've already forgiven me for all my heresy that I've already said towards you. (laughs) Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come, speak to our hearts today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Any football fans in here? Football fans, a few of you? Hopefully not Dallas Cowboy fans. And they're silent. Giants fans, any Giants fans? God loves you too. (laughs) In football, a quarterback and a receiver must trust one another in order to make the right play. Often, the ball is already out of the quarterback's hand before the receiver ever makes his move. You guys know this, right? It's like a blind pass. There's sometimes the quarterback will deceive the defenders. He'll be looking this way, and he already knows where he's got to throw that ball cross field this way. If a receiver doesn't trust that the quarterback is going to throw the ball where he's supposed to be, And if the quarterback can't trust the receiver to run the route as it is written and where he's supposed to go, at best, the pass is going to be incomplete. At worst, the pass is going to be intercepted and run back in the other direction. God, like the quarterback, calls the plays in our lives. He is the one who calls the plays. And we have to trust him to run the play that he calls. We got to trust him that if I run an out pattern and I'm here, that he's going to hook me up right when I'm turning, right when I'm there. But you know what? Many, many times the ball is out of God's hand and we're just running and we're not looking back. We say, ah, ah, when's he going to do it? When's he going to throw it? But we got to make the cut. We got to run the play that he designed because he's already put it where it's supposed to be. It's not part of our series. But Abraham is called by God to bring his son Isaac as a sacrifice. As they're walking up one side of the mountain, Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And Isaac's like, Dad, I think I know what's going on here. But listen, as Abraham and Isaac are walking up one side of the mountain, God already threw the ball. There's a ram walking up the other side of the mountain. As, God, as Abraham and Isaac are walking up one way, God already sent the provision. He already sent the promise, but they couldn't see it. That's what happens in our lives. God calls us to do something. God asks us to do something. And because we don't see it right now, let me see it with my eyes. God, send me a sign. Because we don't have it in the flesh, we lose trust in God. I want to build off of Pastor Chris's sermon last week. It inspired me. This was not supposed to be the sermon for this weekend, but his sermon inspired me. I want to share with you today, why settle for an Ishmael when you should have had an Isaac? Why settle for an Ishmael when you should have had an Isaac. Why settle? Why take, why why break the pattern? Why break the play that God has set you to do? In Genesis 16, verse 1, you guys heard this last week. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar, and Sarai said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. What a sad, sad, sad belief. 
Think about it. She's not just saying, we can't have kids. We're saying, I'm not living the life that I dreamed of, and God is causing it. That's what she's saying. I bet you, there, I bet you have friends who kind of believe the same thing. God is stopping me from having the time of my life. God is preventing me from living my best life. If God would just do more, if God would just move in my life, I would have my best life. That's what she's saying here. God is preventing me from bearing children. That's a sad situation. She's not saying, she's not saying God's not for me. She's straight out saying God is against me. God is against my dreams. God is against my ambitions, against my will. So she makes this plan. She says, go to my servant and be with her so that we can obtain a child by her. And Abraham listened to her voice. So Abraham gets Hagar pregnant. And a big blowout happens in the housewives of of, uh, Israel. (laughs) The real housewives of Israel happen up in here. Hagar flees, an angel of the Lord appears to Hagar and says to her this. He says, the angel said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitudes. This is the illegitimate son. God is still going to keep his word to something illegitimate. That's crazy. That's crazy. But let me show you what it turns out to be. The angel said to her, you'll be pregnant and you'll bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. Yeah, your son's going to be a jackass. His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over and against all the kingsmen. Ishmael was raised in the house of Abraham for 13 years. He was 13 years old when Sarai became pregnant with Isaac. When Sarah became pregnant with Isaac, Abraham comes in and says, Hagar, Ishmael, got to go. Kicks them out. Banishes them to the desert. Now he begins to raise Isaac as his one true son. What does Ishmael become? Commonly regarded by both Jews and Arabs, Ishmael was the progenitor of the Arabs and considered a messenger or a prophet of God in the Quran. Yes, he was the beginning of the Islamic religion. Ishmael, a great nation, and it is. It's a great power, but is against Jehovah God. It is at war against the Jewish nation. Straight enmity between God's design and man's design. A man-made God versus the the creator God. Though little is said about him in the Quran itself, it does have designations for him as the prophet, and it suggests that he assisted Abraham in building some of the structures of the of the Islam religion of the Kuba Kabu in Mecca. I couldn't find any more details about it. I'm sure if you wanted to study history and go a little bit deeper into it, you could see it. But I wonder how many of us have taken decisions into our own hands that have turned into antichrists themselves. Anything in your life that draws you away from the design of God for your life is an antichrist. It is something that is at war for your time with God. Ooh, that's rough, man. That's rough. I don't, I don't control people's lives. I don't get really involved in people's business. But 
it always gets me a little concerned when people say, Pastor Mike, I got a new job, but it's on Sundays and I can't go to church anymore. I understand and I don't blame you for providing for your family. But that might be an Ishmael decision. That might be an Ishmael decision. It might be an Ishmael when God has already sent the Isaac. What happens when we get impatient? What happens when we don't wait on the Lord and we take matters into our own hands? Maybe our offspring is not going to create some kind of radical religion that is trying to destroy Christianity. Maybe that's not going to be the case. But there can be decisions that we make that draw us away from God. And I know this struggle all too well. I am an impatient person. I am an impatient person. And when God isn't moving fast enough, like I want to help him out a little bit. I'm like, well, God, you know, here's my notes on the situation. Here's what I think that we can do to make this a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective. I can help you out. But here's what happens with God. And if you want to talk about this a little bit more, make it a point with Pastor Chris because he likes this weird stuff. He's into sci-fi and uh, Star Wars and Star Trek and end times and, and this concept that I'm about to talk about. God operates outside of time and space, the time-space continuum. God operates outside. God operates in a realm called eternity. And eternity is outside of our time and space. There's only really one time in history that eternity intersected with time, and that was at creation. When he said, let there be light, there was an intersection of eternity and time. Outside of that, God operates outside of it. So when we're like, man, how come God's not operating on my time? Well, because he doesn't have a 24-hour clock. He doesn't go to sleep when the sun goes down. Right? He's in eternity. God doesn't view your life hour by hour, minute by minute. God views your life by your lifespan. From the birth to death. And we get upset that he's not micromanaging the moments when he said, I've given you life. I've given you this lifetime. Be a steward of it. Be a steward of your lifetime. Be a steward of your finances in your lifetime. Be a steward of your health in your lifetime. Be a steward of your relationships in your lifetime. But we are stuck on sun up to sundown. And when God doesn't work in our sun up to sundown timeline, we're aggravated with God. This religion doesn't work. This religion doesn't work because I can't manipulate God to move fast enough. Pastor Mike, it's so hard to wait on God in this fast-paced, have-it-your-way, DoorDash, Uber Eat society. I was flying home yesterday, got stuck on a plane for 10 hours. 10 hours on a plane for a four-hour flight. I got home at 3.30 this morning. Praise God I'm operating on caffeine right now. But I was serious. I was like, yo, can I door dash food from the, from the ramp onto the plane? Like, I'm hungry, right? And like, we're getting upset because we just can't get a burger when we want a burger. Like, listen, those little peanuts on the airplane ain't enough for 10 hours. Come on, somebody. We can have groceries delivered to our house in under an hour. God, why aren't you delivering the goods when I want them? Because God don't work for you. And God don't work for tips. We get this jaded. We get this jaded as if God works for us, as if he's our employee or our servant. Don't get it jaded that he washed feet so he works for you. He wasn't doing a pedicure. He was teaching a principle. He was teaching a principle about loving your neighbor, about caring for one another. Don't get it wrong, we have always served him. And we will serve him in time as well. God, I trust you 
with time. It's so funny that it's easy to talk about trusting him in eternity, outside of time, but it's so hard to trust him in time. Here's some things that we need. Faith is important. Faith is needed to trust God. Faith is needed if we are going to align with his timeline. Faith is needed. Now let's look at this. Hebrews 11.1 1 is the definition of faith. That's the most confusing thing you ever heard. Ready? Let's look at it. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is. Here's the definition. Faith is what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thank you. I have no idea what that means. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is a confident assurance that what I hope for is going to happen. Faith is confidence in what I'm hoping for is going to happen. What I'm hoping for is going to happen. Many of us just need to change our mindset. We're so negative we're so negative. You know the whole like glass half empty, glass half full. And like, yeah, negative people see it half empty. No, negative people are just done with the whole thing. Negative people are like, just fill the glass in the garbage. That's where we're at in society. We're so negative, nothing's good enough. We have no hope, we don't think anything's gonna work out. Because of that, we're not living our best life. We're not living a joy-filled life. We're not even happy because we're so negative. This is what it's talking about here. Faith is the assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It's the evidence of things that we cannot yet see with our eyes. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see with our eyes. Faith is an inner conviction that says the only evidence that I need that God is gonna work in my life is what his word says. His word says that he will do it, I trust him at his word. You must see the God outcome in your mind before you see it in the flesh. And I, and I use the word mind very carefully because I know that we want to over-spiritualize it. We want to say, well, you got to see it in your heart. you got to see it in your spirit. And I get all that. But how do you process what's in your heart? How do you process what's in your spirit? By your brain. Your mind is the filter of the things that God is speaking to you. As much as you can get in tune with your spirit, it still has to be processed by your brain. Okay. So your mind has to see it. Your mind has to see the thing before you see it in the flesh. Man, this is just simple manifesting anything in your life. In the business world, you got a business idea. You've got to see that thing in your mind before you begin to see it in the flesh. That's all this verse is talking about. So faith is needed. Faith is the substance. Faith is the assurance. Faith is the thing that I'm standing under. What are you standing under? What is the promise of God? What's that assurance? The assurance is God's word. His word is the assurance. That's why we have Bible stories. Looking at what God has done in other people's lives. And we can say, man, if God did it for them, he will do it for me. What's the evidence? What's the proof? Well, we understand that God cannot lie and God cannot change. God is not a man that he should lie or that he could lie. God is incapable of lying. If God could lie or ever did lie, it negates his whole word. He cannot lie. So if his word says it, it has to happen. It has to occur. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday yesterday today and forever. God cannot lie. He can't, say that with me. God cannot lie and God cannot change. Now you just have to get to the place where you theologically believe that. Until you get there, you're going to continue to doubt his word. Well, I know what the Bible says, but my experience outweighs what the Bible says. Now we're in a real bad theological position. We're in a real bad theological position. 
when you base the truth of God and the character of God and the nature of God by your experience and not his word, we have a problem. Because I'll tell you this, your experience can lie to you. Your experience can lie to you. One day I was outside a food truck and I had this dude grilling me, looking at me hard. All up in my face. You know, I'm feeling some sort of way, right? I'm like trying to keep my cool, like the joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy of the Lord is my strength. God, give me peace. And, but I'm getting pissed off because he's like in my face, like grilling me, uh, looking at me like this and this, on both sides of me. And I'm like, yo, bro, you got a problem? Finally, I had enough. It's about to happen. Like my hands started to shake. It's going down. It's up in my grill. You got a problem? He's like, what? No, I'm trying to look at the menu behind you. <laughs> my experience told me we're about to fight. Truth was, I was standing in front of the menu. It's very, very dangerous when you build theology based upon experience. Your experience can be a lie. Your feelings can be a lie. Your emotions can be a lie. All right. God is not a man that he should lie. He cannot change. Abraham is called to be the father of many nations, but when it's not happening in his timeline, he takes matters into his own hands he gets impatient. Just like a quarterback can get impatient. The receiver's not running the play. Or the receiver can get impatient. The quarterback didn't throw it. Now we have an incomplete. Or we have an interception. And what happens when an interception occurs? The team that was once on offense is now on defense. They're not trained for defense. They suck at defense. That's why they're on offense. Offensive players stink at tackling. That's why most interceptions go back for six. That's called a pick six. Because they're not trained for it. They're not good at it. And we're not good at now undoing mistakes. And many of us keep living our lives on defense when we're called for offense because we keep trying to fix our mistakes. Over and over again, chasing a ball that should have been a TD. We didn't trust the play. We should have had an Isaac. And instead, we're chasing down Ishmael. And this sucks, man. I've been there. I made mistakes. I could try and track down and ask people to forgive me and make amends and work my 12 steps and do all those things. It stinks, man. That, that, that's what these hands create when they're done with, for evil. When they're done with the wrong intentions. When they're not in God's timeline. I just want to ask you a few things, a few questions. Do you trust God? Do you trust his time? Can, can God fix your marriage? Can God redeem your time? Can God restore your health? Can God bring financial provision into your household? Can God bring your womb to life that the doctors call dead? Can God bring the perfect mate into your life? See, only you can decide that. Only you can decide what you can trust God for. Do you trust him? The main problem with God is these timelines. And many of us are walking around with Ishmael-sized burdens instead of Isaac-sized blessings. We can end that, though. We can stop that. We don't have to keep that curse going. We don't have to keep that cycle going. Many of us have settled for a bootleg version of our life. Instead of the real thing, man, you remember when bootleg DVDs first came out, anybody? You got to be about my age, about 40, 40-ish age. 
bootleg DVDs came out, right? And, and you, you'd be at the barbershop. Ah! You'd be, <laughs> you'd be at the barbershop, and the guy walk in with the black garbage bag. Yo, 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 I got the hot movies. I got the hot movies. Want to see what I got? I'm like, yo, I've been wanting to see that. He pulls out the Blu-ray. I mean, it's in the blue DVD case, Blu-ray. And the package looks right. The package looks right. He got the printout on the, on the <laughs> HP color jet printer and everything. Then you open it up, and it's either like stamped the name of the movie or written in Sharpie marker. You're like, okay, that's not legit, but hey, it's only 10 bucks. We'll do this for 10 bucks. And you get that joint home. You got your popcorn. You got your soda. You put that DVD in, and you quickly realize that it's your boy sitting in the theater with a little camcorder. <coughs> that joint's bootleg. It's bootleg. It looks a lot like the original. It looks really authentic until you get into it. And some of us have made those decisions that look somewhat authentic but his bootleg. And the further we get down the road, the worse it gets. His hand starts getting tired. Ah, oh, now I joint sideways. You're watching a movie. Still see it. We're good, we're good. <laughs> Maybe sad if it wasn't true. The movie's supposed to be HD. It was supposed to be Blu-ray. HD's his design. It's supposed to be his design for our life. And we're settling for SD, self-design, standard definition, standard, basic, bootleg. That's not the life you're called to lead. You're called to lead 4K life, man. 8K life, 12K now. Crisp excellence, above normality. Now, don't get me wrong. Waiting on God don't mean being lazy either. I got three steps for you today. Three steps to not be lazy, but act on what God has promised you. You ready? Number one is this. Get a scripture. Get a scripture. What is the evidence that you're standing on? What is the word that you're standing on? I'll give you an example. A few years ago, my sister had this, like, problem in her gums between her teeth. She found a verse in the Bible. It says that God would take the infirmity from between your teeth. She's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that scripture. I'm standing on that word. Man, she wrote that down. She put it on a mirror. She claimed it over her life every single day. One day she woke up, the thing was gone. Gone. Come on, somebody. Get a scripture, what are you standing on? What verse has God promised you that applies to a situation in your life that needs to move forward? I remember when my dad was having a really hard time with the idea of retirement. And all his friends, who were idiots, kept saying, there ain't no such thing as retirement in the Bible. Pastors don't retire, they refire." I said, Dad, your friends just showed their ignorance for the Bible that they've never read it. Because in the book of Leviticus, it specifically talks about retirement. That at the age of 25, they will enter the tent of meat. And at 55, they shall labor no more. If you struggle with retirement, thinking that you can't do it, that you shouldn't do it, and, and what am I going to do next? Man, stand on a word. Get a vision for that next season of your life. There's a scripture for everything. Got to put a little work into it. Number two, once you get a scripture, get an image. Get an image. What does being healed look like? Say you got a skin disease, you got a skin rash, you got eczema all over your body. Man, go find a picture of someone that got beautiful skin that you want. Now, we're not lusting that skin. It's not coveting that skin. It's faith. It's faith. I have an image of what I want. Maybe you're believing God for a car. You're believing God for a house. Believing, believing God for a job, for health in your body. Get an image. What does it look like when you're healthy? 
What does that look like? When I'm healthy, I will go for a, a, a run a marathon. So then get a picture of a marathon. Put up on your thing. Now start training for that marathon. Come on, somebody. Get a scripture. Get an image. What are you seeing in your mind? Now listen, this is not just biblical stuff. Man, this is business. This is leadership. What does it look like you having a management role at your job? What does it look like? How are you going to dress? How are you going to dress when you're the manager? So start dressing that way now. Ooh, okay, somebody, okay, okay. This ain't faking it. This ain't faking it until you're making it. This is faith. This is faith. Now I'm going to be there one day. So I'm going to start acting like it now. I'm going to start leading from where I'm at. I'm going to lead up from where I'm at now. Well, if they would just give me a raise, then I'd, no, you're never going to lead. You ain't. You ain't, because it ain't about the money. It ain't about the money. It's about the decision that you're making to be the person that's going to move up the ladder. All right, get an image. Get a scripture, get an image. Number three, get confessing. Get confessing. Get confessing. Now, this is not name it and claim it. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm saying is change the words that are coming out of your mouth. Change the, man, if you just talk negative all the time, just shut up, right? So like, don't eat, so <laughs> I will say this, before you even like start beginning to talk positive, just shut up about being negative. Just don't say nothing, right? Mama said it like this, you ain't got nothing nice to say. Well, your mom would say it like that. <laughs> my mom would say, shut up. That's how my mom spoke to me, shut up, shut your mouth. If you ain't got nothing nice, so you're already painting a negative picture. Well, everything works out for everybody else. It's never going to work out for me. You are right. You are right. Absolutely. Every time you speak negative and any time you speak down about yourself, it's never going to work for me. I can't do that. You are absolutely correct. Whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're correct. The power of your mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You paint the picture of your life with the power, with the pen of your tongue. What life are you speaking? Stop the negative talk in your home. Speak things that are uplifting and build people up. Stop cutting people down. Stop gossiping in your home. Build things up. Paint a beautiful picture of life. Start confessing the promises over your life. I'm going to be a millionaire one day. Start confessing over yourself. Start confessing over yourself. I'm going to be a millionaire one day. Pastor Mike, that's crazy. Why would you say that? Why not? Why not? Come on. I'm going to drive a wonderful car one day. Whatever the car is, right there, I'm going to drive this kind of car. Oh, that's just arrogant. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you? You're settling for a life so far beneath what God's designed for you, man. This, this isn't about self-promotion. This isn't about, man, God wants to stink and bless you if you just get out of his way. All right, let me, all right. Hey, listen, man, if you had the option between buying your kids the dream gift for Christmas and buying them a dollar store toy, which one would you prefer to buy them? The toy, the toy of their dreams, right? Because you're a good parent, and you want the best for them. You want them to have everything they've ever dreamed of. That's your heavenly father. And we've believed some false religion. We believe some false religion that God doesn't want that for you. And so, because God doesn't want it, he's withholding from me. Like Sarah said, God's preventing me from being blessed. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And that's why we keep having Ishmael's. And we got this endless cycle where we're chasing bad decisions that push us further from God. And God says, if you just trust me, I'd make your dreams come true. If you just trust me, I would bless the works of your hands. If you just trust me, I put those dreams in you. I put those desires in you. I put those wants in you and I want to make them happen. Trust me. Follow me. But it comes by faith. If you've never had an opportunity to extend your faith into the family of God, to be a child of God and have access to these blessings that he promised us in his word, we'd love to offer that to you today if you're watching online and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. 
Maybe you're watching this a year from now on Facebook or you've came across on YouTube. You said, man, something about that message today is just resounding in my heart. I need Jesus. I want to offer that to you today. And this is, oh man, this is what I love about the internet. Like, this message can operate outside of time, really, because we're preaching it live today, but 10 years from now, someone could be finding this. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to make that commitment, to say yes to Jesus. And we do that by praying a prayer, and that prayer goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.